Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I was preaching a few months, weeks ago, and the Spirit of God put in my spirit. When I got done a sermon, the Lord said three things that he wanted me to touch on. The first one is our faith will be tested. We shared on that already. The second one is we, we can command God, but we can't. And I shared about the two blind men that came down the road, and Jesus asked them if I can heal you. And they said, yeah, we believe you can do anything. And then he turned it back on them and said, according to your faith, let it be whole. And so today I want to do the third point, and this will start out in Matthew chapter 9. Whoops, you did an extra four minutes. <laughs> extra, I, gotta put, I get lost in time in the spirit, amen, amen. Somehow I look over and it's already 46 minutes, you know, wow, I'm only granted 45. In 49 it says, verse 1, and he entered in a ship and he passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy. He was lame, lying on a back. And Jesus, seeing their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy. Now, I'm going to come back to that. In Mark chapter 2, puts a little more light on this situation. In Mark chapter 2, uh, bound around verse 3, I think it is. It said, well, we'll start at verse 1. And he came and entered into Capernaum. Now, I don't know if you know this about Jesus. He didn't own a house. Peter was wealthy. And so Peter was in the fishing trade business with John and James, the father of Zebedee, and they had a good fishing business. They were very successful. And Peter had a, like an apartment complex. And so he rented one out. I doubt if he rented it. He probably came gave it to the Lord to use, so that was his house on the earth. And so Jesus didn't have a house. He kept traveling in ministry. Once he got anointed by God, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus now with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing healing all that were possessed, so he didn't really stay put. He traveled as an evangelist. He went to town, the city, the village, and his fame was going out. And remember, up to age 30, no one knew who Jesus was. He was God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We understand that. Verse 14, he became flesh. He grew up as a babe. He got his diapers changed and he got fed. I doubt if they had formula back then. And his mother raised him. He went through peer pressure. He went through childhood stage, teenager stage. He was the firstborn, so he had to carry on the name of the family. Uh, he was a carpenter, so he did carpentry business. And for 30 years, he did nothing. Absolutely nothing. Think about that. But in Luke 4, it tells us that he went into the church, his synagogue, customarily, and read the Word. He studied the Word on his own. Because in Luke 4, when he was handed the Scripture, the book of Isaiah, he's the one that found the place. And remember, it's a scroll and so we read left to right, they read right to left, so he had to roll it all the way out. And if you don't know where, I, where Luke 4.18 is, it's Isaiah 61. So he had to roll it out, and it wasn't chapters and verses then. It was just written as a book by Isaiah the prophet. And so he found a place and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And right after that, he was around age 30, Luke 3 says. Right after he gets filled with the Holy Ghost, it says his fame went out. We begin to understand who we are in Christ. If we understand who we truly are under the Spirit, this fame will go out. And I'm telling you, God is ready to do something great. Hold on. And so I want you to see here, and now he's traveling. This is early in his ministry. And he enters, all that to say he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was home in the house. Well, I can't wait till people hear about what God is doing and come to the house. Amen. And straightway many were gathered together and so much there was no room to receive them. Now what it was in his apartment complex, they would have a, a middle section 
where they would come out and eat together or fellowship together. And as I explained this, their roofs were flat because they didn't have a lot of rain. They didn't have a lot of humidity over there. And so they didn't need pitch roofs. We need them because the snow would rot your roof and start to leak. And so we have pitched roofs so the snow comes off. And so don't stay on your roof. But there, you'll start to read that Peter went up on the roof during noon and prayed. It wasn't he was sitting up there hanging on a pitched roof and praying. It was flat, and it's where they would go to have their meals. It's where the family would gather and fellowship. It's where the cool of the evening would come, and they would sit out and watch the sunset. And so you get a kind of a picture of this roof because it's going to come into play. And so all these people are not only standing in the room of Jesus, but they're out in this, this square, and it's packed. It's, it's filled to the rim. And it goes, and it says, they gathered together, and so much there was no room to receive them, so much about a door, and he preached the word unto them. And I shared with you last week that everywhere Jesus was, one of his first things he would proclaim is the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me. Jesus was a man. He emptied himself of his glory. He became a man like you and me. In his spirit, he was God, but in his flesh, he was a man. And he could do nothing. He, could, he said, I do nothing unless the Father shows me. I say nothing unless the Father tells me. So he totally depended on the Spirit of God to move in his ministry. And again, Jesus did nothing up to age 30. The Spirit of God comes upon him, Matthew 3 and Luke 3 talk about that. He's around age 30. He did nothing for God. You can't search the strips and find that he did. And as soon as the Spirit of God came upon him, he gave up his carpentry business. He gave up his firstborn position in the family, and he starts out into ministry. And he has no ministry. He has no people. He has no church. He has no name, so he begins to preach the word. It says in Matthew 4, he said he went out teaching, preaching, and healing. Matthew 9 said he went out teaching, preaching, and healing. So here he is. A, a crowd gathers, and Jesus takes that opportunity and begins to preach the word. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of palsy, which was born of four. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press. Now, I'm going to stop there and go to Luke. Hold your finger here. And then I'm going to come back and forth. In Luke chapter 5, we get the same story. And when God mentions something at least twice, he wants you to pay attention to it not on one thing that's mentioned but at least twice so this is three times three different gospel writers three different men receive this into their spirit and they write it because God wanted it written in his word this starts around verse 17 of chapter 5 came to pass on a certain day he was teaching maybe he had a preach teach on him I don't know Remember, preaching is proclaiming, teaches is explaining. If you go through the scriptures, you'll find that Jesus taught more in the church and preached outside of the church. Why is that? You should know that you should be born again. You should know that you should be filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues. You should know that God can heal. You should know that God can deliver. You should know these things. We should not have to continue to keep proclaiming these truths to you. You should know them on your own behalf. But he, he comes in and he begins to teach the truth of God's word, John 17, 17, my word is truth. So you'll see that Jesus teaches more in church and proclaims more out of the church. And so here he is, he's teaching the word. And the crowd was made up of religious people, Catholics, Assembly of God, Methodist, Baptist. Oh, they weren't around there, I know. But these were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots, but mostly were Pharisees. They were, they, were the, they were the religious sect most closely to what we believe. And they were who the people believed in and trusted to deliver them the word of God. And so they come to hear Jesus. And I, and I thought this was interesting because Pharisees and theologies of doctors of theology, sitting by which came out of every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem 
And the anointing power of the Lord was present to heal. Did you know that same power is in this room right now? The Holy Ghost is everywhere. God is everywhere. But I'm trying to teach you how to get connected with the Holy Spirit. I shared with you last week that I sat and I was, uh, they told me I, I, they didn't know what to do with me. They finally, after about five or six years out of University Penn in California and Mayo Clinic and, and John Hopkins and all these doctors, a list of them like this, they finally came up with one medicine that could help me. And I began to take that and it wasn't doing much for me. And so I began to pray in, in the Holy Ghost and read the Word of God and I shared this last week. And a man of God was coming around up in Canada and the Spirit of God quickened me to go. Just because you go to the meeting doesn't mean it's going to do anything for you. Here's a whole room full of religious folks. Here's a whole room full of doctors of theology. And nothing's going to happen for them. What are you coming to church for? This is my point. Are you coming here to receive something from the Spirit of God? When you come here in the morning, you should come saying, God, I'm coming. I believe that I'm going to receive from you. Whatever I need, you know I already need, so I'm asking you to help me with those needs. You might even come with a physical need. You might come with a family need. You might come with a work need. You might come with a financial need. You might come with some kind of need. Believe that you receive it when you come. And I'm asking you, when you come, believe that you receive, that you'll receive something from the teaching of the Word. Because the more you believe and receive, the more anointing I will get. The more the Spirit of God will come upon me. And I shared that with you. Out of Mark 5, there was a woman with the issue of blood and she heard about Jesus. And around Jesus, there's about 100 to 200 people, up to 500 people, thronging him, choking him, crowding him out. The disciples got around Jesus and they were like bodyguards trying to keep the people off from pulling on his hair and pulling on his robe and pulling on his arm and pulling on him everywhere. And you know how exhausting that would be? And so finally this woman said, when I touch his garment, I will be healed. I believe that when I touch his garment, I will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the power of God to heal me. And so she pushes in. She's bleeding for 12 years. She's anemic. She's, she's, she's white. She's weak. They gave up on her. She became bankrupt in our country. And I was just reading this again in the Old Testament, going through my Bible again for the year. And they were sent to the outskirts of the community and they had to clip on their upper lip when someone came and raised their hand and said, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. <laughs> Talk about humil humiliation. But anyway, that's how they did it. She heard about Jesus. She spent all of her wealth, she says, and the scholars say that she was very wealthy. She spared every penny on every doctor she could come across and she grew worse. She's desperate, she's bankrupt, she's hopeless, and she hears about Jesus. She pushes in. And she pushes in with all of her might. She's weak, she's bleeding. Everybody she touched, according to the Levitical law, they're unclean to evening. They had to present themselves to the priest and be pronounced clean. And so she's pushing in and pushing in and pushing in. That crowd that's crowding around Jesus and he has his disciples pushing him back so he can move because he's going to the house of Jairus to, to pray for his dead daughter. And all of a sudden, he stops in his tracks and says, somebody touched me. And I share this story over a hundred times that, that Peter turns around, got a little miffed with him and said, what do you mean somebody's touching you? Hundreds of people are touching you. Are you serious? Is this a real question? And he said, no, somebody touched me. God is of the spirit. You're a spirit. And the way to touch God's spirit is through faith. It's the way that he has created it for you to receive anything that you need from him has to come by faith. Faith comes by the hearing and the hearing and the hearing and the hearing and the hearing of the word of God. And remember that word of God there is Haramatos Chris 2. That logos has to go down into your spirit. You've got to find a promise that God obligated himself to you. 
you got to obligate yourself to the word of God and you got to keep planting that seed in your spirit over and over and over and over. That's Mark 4, 26 through 29. When that seed, that log, is becomes harema, when it becomes faith in your spirit, the spirit of God, the harema of Christu, the Christu, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's sealed in you, 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21, 22, 2 Corinthians 5, 5, and Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It's sealed into you. There's an earnest, a measure of the Holy Ghost in you that you received when you were born again. When he took out of you that nature of sin and put within you that Holy Spirit, that sealed into you, that, that Zoe, that seed of God. And so she pushed in and she said, I believe when I receive, I will be healed. Deep down in your spirit, if you keep putting the seed of God into your spirit over and over and over. And just like an old cow when we used to work on a dairy farm. When you're making money is when the cow's laying down. Because the cow has like three stomachs. It'll eat and swallow in the first stomach, puke it up and chew it. Chew the cud, that's the same word for meditate. You chew up that word of God. You bring it up into your mind and meditate on it. You think on it. You ask the Holy Spirit to lighten your mind. And as he enlightens your mind, he'll direct you and guide you in what to do. And so this woman, she's guided by the Spirit of God. And she keeps saying to herself, within herself, when I touch his garment, I will be healed. And when he, she touched Jesus, just the tassel, Luke says, she barely touched the tassel that hanged from his robes. The Jews had those. When she touched him, the power of God went out of Jesus. It said virtue, but all, all the words in the Greek are dunamis. It means power. And Jesus stopped in his tracks and said, somebody touched him. And hundreds of people have been touching him all morning. And Peter said, well, are you joking? And Jesus turned around and looked at the woman. She fell down trembling and told the testimony of how she heard about him and how she pressed in with faith. And how she touched his garment and the power of God went out of him into her. And how he felt the power of God go out of him. And he turned around and said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. And so I'm sitting up in the mountains of Pennsylvania praying in the Holy Ghost for months. And the Spirit of God tells me to take the money we have left. We're making about $500 for the whole month. And so we take the little bit of money we have and we go up there and I sit in there and I walk in and I said, I'm coming to this meeting, Father. And I believe that I receive. I believe that, that you sent me here for a purpose. You directed and guided me here by the Spirit of the living God. And I believe I'm going to receive. I walk in the building and the trombone player, or the trumpet player, comes running over and says, the man of God wants you to sit up in the special seats. I said, all right. I ain't going to turn that down because he carried a crowd. And he took me up to the front, and I sat down in the front row of all the pastors, and he comes out, and he looks at me, and he says, come on up here, son. And before he hit my roof on the way up there, I said, I believe I receive whatever you got for me. God, I believe I receive it. I believe I receive it. I'm desperate, God. I'm dying. I have no hope. Doctors have no hope. We're done. This is it. This is it, or I'm going. I retired out of ministry. We're sitting in the mountains praying the Holy Ghost, reading the Word. And I'll never forget it. His hand come around, and it was coming down. I watched it come down, and the power of God hit me on the head. And it was like a 220 jolt. It went down my spine and out my hips. I went down my buns, boom, 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 off the floor. And here I am today preaching the Word of God. Amen. When you come here, you've got to believe that you receive. If you come in here to say, well, I'm going to go in there and see if they have anything, if they teach anything, you're not going to get anything. If you come in here expecting that God's going to teach you something or touch your life and what you need, he will meet you. And Jesus is teaching them. What did he teach them? The same thing he taught everybody. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to preach and teach the Word. God has anointed me to heal. God has opened. God has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. God has healed me to set the captives free. And that's how Jesus would open up his service. And that would create a faith. Because everybody that came to Jesus was desperate. 
Let me show you, for example, when the rumor went out. In Matthew 4, this is right when Jesus, hold your finger, we're coming right back to Luke. When Jesus began his ministry, he left the carpenter business. He had no plans. He, had no, he didn't gather up his finances to go overseas. He didn't, have a, he didn't have a bank account. He had nothing, just what he had on his back. And the faith in his heart. For 30 years, think about this. God on the earth for 30 years is waiting to be used. I met Christians that came into the body of Christ. If they're not doing something within four or five years, they quit. They don't think God called them. God didn't choose them to do something. Maybe there's no purpose for them. And so they kind of window out and they kind of fizzle away. 30 years, Jesus had to believe that he was the Son of God, that he was the seed. He watched his stepdad die right in front of him. He couldn't do anything. And I imagine he had meditation moments over that. But when he becomes 30, he gets filled with the Holy Ghost, comes upon him like a dove. And then he goes out, he resigns from the firstborn position, he leaves the family, he walks out and he fulfills the call of God on his life. They had no idea who he was. And nobody he ministered to had an idea who he was. Even the disciples didn't even know who he was. But do you know who you are? You are chosen, you are called, and you're ordained of God. He has a foreordained, predestinated for every life in this church. If you have been born of the Spirit, you, He has a plan for your life. Do you believe and receive that? Do you really believe that? Where I'm just go to church and listen to a few good songs and, and I know they want my money, so I'll put a buck in the plate so everybody sees me put something in. And I'll hear a sermon and go home and live the rest of my week doing what I want to do. Thank God Jesus continued to hold on. That he was the Lamb of God. That he was the seed of God. That he was the Son of God. Amen. And then when the Holy Ghost came upon him, he knew that it was his time to move out. The Spirit of God led him and directed him. I met so many people that would say, well, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm going to stay in this dead church. Why would you do that? Why not gather with a body of Christians that believe that God's going to pour out His Spirit and do mighty things for that region that you're living in and turn it from dark to light to take the lost and let them be found. Let those that are dead become alive. Let God move. Let God manifest. Let God put the show on. But He's not going to do it till you believe it and receive it. Look at Matthew 4, verse 23. Jesus went about. This is when He left His family. He went about teaching in the synagogue. See that? He always taught in the church, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of Christ, healing all manner, every kind of sickness and every kind of disease among the people. And his fame went out. I know sometimes people get discouraged and say, where's all the programs? And I told you I was a little weird. I come here believing that God was going to draw men and women all over this region, bring them in and fill them with the Word of God and the Holy Ghost, and God was going to set them loose and let them go through this region wherever they go to their jobs, their homes, their families, their fun time, and the power of God can come upon you and you can begin to see the miracles and the manifestations of the Holy Ghost demonstrated through you. Amen. Then the people will come. Jesus had no crowd. Jesus had nothing signed up. He didn't rent out the, the fire hall. He didn't rent out the, the way place down here. He didn't rent out any kind of... He just started going out and started saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And the people began to come. And it said throughout the Syria, brought all sick people. Here's Jesus' church. As a pastor, we want the rich. We want the well-off. We want the givers. We want tithers. We want the offer givers. We want people to get involved. Here's what happens when the anointing of God hits. They brought to him the sick people, taken with diver diseases and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatics, and those that had palsy, and he healed them. Here's what I wanted you to see. 
And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. That Decapolis is, Deca is ten, Paulus is a city. He traveled through ten cities. They came from all over. Back to Luke 5, notice there, these, these religious people hearing about what God was doing. I'm saying religious people. I'm talking about Jews, Jews of the Old Covenant. They heard about Jesus. Yes, Lord. They heard about Jesus. And they came from Galilee. Isn't that what it just said when he started his ministry and the fame went out? Fame's going out. It made religious people jealous. It made the churches get jealous. He's getting a better crowd than we are. He's getting a multitude and we got a few. And let's go see what he's about. Let's go hear him. Let's, let's go see if we can catch him in something. So we can go around on the radio and the TV and write books and say how he's a cult and how he's of the devil and how, how, how he speaks for Satan. That's what, they accused him of this. Religious people. power of the Lord, the anointing of God was present. Why? you got to start understanding wherever you go, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is there because it's in you and on you. we got to begin to understand who we are. Our churches are dying because we don't understand who we are. We're trying to build a children's program. We're trying to build a youth program. That's all good and fine. But God's looking for laborers that will come in and labor and have authority over the devils, have authority over sickness and disease. He called 12 men and one of them was full of the devil and sent them out. God never changed his vision for God was in this. Let's get off of that. The Lord wants me to do this. I'll do it. In Matthew chapter 11, I'll come back to Luke. That's my sermon. I'll get there. In Matthew 11, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus made an end of the commanding of the twelve, he departed thence to teach and to preach in the cities. You'll see that all about Jesus. He didn't stay in a building. He had something God put in him and on him. He was excited for what God did for him. And he went out and he wanted to share with whomever God would show him to share it with and tell them whatever God spoke into his spirit to say. Now John the Baptist, remember him? The one that baptized him in water? He had a vision, and he, in that vision he saw the Holy Spirit fall on Jesus. In that vision he heard the words of God say, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the land that takes away the sins of the world. John is having a mini vision. He's a prophet of the Old Testament. He's operating in the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and discerning of spirit. And when I say these things, I don't even know if half the church knows what I'm talking about. And these are still. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, God said this. He said, Brethren and sistren, Let's not be ignorant of the things that pertain and belong unto the fluence of the Holy Spirit. The word there, spiritual, is pneumakos. It means those things that pertain and belong unto the fluence of the Holy Ghost. God's looking for a group of people that will begin to understand who the Holy Spirit is, that the Holy Spirit is sealed upon them in the water of well, and that when He comes upon you, He can flow out of you like rivers of living water. And anyway, John the Baptist had a vision. He saw, he saw the Spirit of God. He saw, he saw the Spirit of God come on Jesus. And he heard a voice in the realm of the Spirit, discerning his spirits and say, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He also heard in the Spirit saying, This is the Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. Here's John. He's in prison. John went around preaching judgment. John went around telling this woman that was living with a man in open sin, You're going to hell! You're going to hell. It's not right to have your brother's wife. The woman got tired of it. She is the governor's wife. So the daughter gives a sexual dance on birthday when they're all cranked up on dope and wine and alcohol. And they're feeling good. They're getting the beat. And the woman comes out, his stepdaughter, said she was good looking. She starts to do a sex dance. 
They all get entire, intrigued and enticed. And when she's over, they all liked it. They were all pleased. The men were just, mm, man, that was good. And he said, I'll give you up to the half of my kingdom. She runs to her mother and says, you said he'd give me half the kingdom. What do I ask for, Mom? Ask for the head of John the Baptist. I am so tired of that man telling me I'm living in sin and going to hell. I don't want to hear it anymore. I want him out of my face. <laughs> and so he took him and put him in prison, and he's waiting to have his head cut off. That's where we're at here. The Lord said to tell you this. Jesus is ministering in John chapter 8. And I'll tell you how bad this is. The theology of religion couldn't believe that John 8 is a part of the New Testament. So some of the early manuscripts that we have in Greek took this out. They also took the last part of Mark 16 out. Because religion can't understand the power and the move of the Spirit, the things that belong and pertain unto the fluence of the Holy Ghost, the manifestation of the Spirit, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning spirit, special faith, work of miracles, gifts of healings, prophecy, tongues, interpretation, tongues. And there's four that should be operating in our congregation constantly. In every service, four of them can manifest. Let's pick it up. And Jesus was ministering, and they brought him a naked woman caught in adultery. And threw him at the feet of Jesus as she's completely naked, caught in sexual intercourse. When Jesus gets down, he looks at the woman. A bunch of elders of the church brought her to him. And it says in the Bible that he stooped down and he began to write in the sand. And there's many different interpolations of different scholars' interpretation, but I like this one. From the eldest to the youngest, I'm talking ministry experience, he gets down and he begins to write their sin in the sand. And every time they saw their sin, the Spirit of God would convict them and they would walk away. And so Jesus lifted up and said, where's, where's your condemners? Where's your judges? And the naked woman said, there is none. He said, I don't judge you either. I come to judge no man. I've come to judge no man. And Jesus said to say this to you. In John 16, when Jesus is ready to leave the earth, he says, it's expedient that I leave. If I don't leave, the comforter can't come. The Holy Ghost can't come. And once after he said that the Holy Ghost would come, the comforter, he said this, he will the Holy Spirit's job is to convict, convince, expose, and rebuke, number one, of sin, number two, of righteousness, and number three, judgment in the realm of the Spirit. We took on our behalf of the church through religion to be the judge. We judged everybody from Adam to Zebra Man. Because, I don't know, made us feel self-righteous. Jesus said, I come to judge no man. Only the word that God speaks out of his mouth will judge you. So Jesus looked at that naked woman that was caught in adultery and said, where's your condemners? Where's your judges? And she said, there is none. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. But one thing, one thing, if you continue to do this, something worse is going to happen. I can't, I can't stop it next time. If you continue down this road a path of sin, I as God on the earth, God in the flesh, I cannot help you because you opened yourself to sin. And because you did, the devil's going to kill, steal, and destroy. But I can save you. On that note, look at now Matthew 11. Verse 2, John heard in prison the works of Christ. He couldn't get it. Religion cannot understand the move of the Spirit. They cannot understand the power of God. They cannot understand the manifestations of the working of miracles, the gifts of healings, the discerning of spirits. They just can't grasp it in their peanut. So what do they do? They call it of the devil. They kept telling Jesus, you're a buzzabell. The Lord of the Fro the Lord of the Flies. That's disgusting. 
you cast the devils out by the name of Satan. And anyway, John heard in the prison the works of Christ and he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, are you the one that is to come or do we look for another? He was in the spirit and saw the Holy Ghost come upon him and heard God speak to him in the spirit and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. But religion can't grasp that. They can't understand it. Don't get mad at them. You pray to their eyes or their spirit open up. John sends to him, he says, I, I don't understand how you're ministering. I don't understand how you let that woman caught in adultery to go free. See, he's in prison for telling this woman that married her husband's brother that they were in sin. Religion is always good to bring out religion and judgment. Doesn't the Bible say if you're divorced and your woman or man's still alive and you marry another, you commit adultery? See, that's religion. Paul changes that in 1 Corinthians 7. Jesus answered and said, Go show John again these things that you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Jesus didn't go around judging women that are caught in sexual intercourse and call them whores and call them adulterers, adulteresses. He didn't go into Matthew's house, the publican, and judge them for all being alcoholics and drug addicts. And the religious people got all upset. How dare that man eat with drunks and dopers? He's a glutton and a wine bibber. Religion can't get it. The leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Who blessed whosoever shall not stumble at this. Blessed whoever will not get offended at this and frustrated and angry and come against the man and the woman that believes that they have the spirit of the Lord in them and on them and that God has called them, chosen and ordained them. Jesus said, I call you friends, not servants any longer because I show unto you all that the Father has for you. And I've called you and I chose you, ordained you. I personally called you. And in that same chapter, John 15, it goes on and says, you didn't ask for me. You didn't call out to me. I chose you. I called on you. You have to begin to understand that, that God chose you. He wants me to do this. 